Hello, this is Justin Cates, Director of Emergency Management for the City of Nashua, New Hampshire, and also a board member at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, NAPSIG. And I want to welcome you to another component of our uh, session at the Inspired Conference on project development, project design, um, and innovation. Uh, this is uh, an interesting case study that uh, we're going to watch here. Uh, this is something that has been really interesting to me in finding ways to partner uh, with academia uh, and the uh, emergency management, homeland security, public safety realm. Um, here with me today is Sid Salia from uh, Mines, uh, Colorado School of Mines. Uh, they are really the innovators on how to make that connection between uh, academia and the homeland security community through their uh, Hacking for Homeland Security program. Sid, tell us a little bit about what this program is. Well, so the program, as you said, is a partnership. Um, we uh, have uh, government agencies, FEMA, uh, Department of Defense, other folks uh, submit problems, uh, challenges that they face uh, every day. Some of them more complex than others, but they're mostly having to do with uh, how they go about doing business. And they submit these uh, challenges slash problems uh, to us. We uh, develop a class, we form a class, and then we have students team up uh, to work on each of the problems. So each team gets assigned to one uh, problem, one sponsor. And then together with the sponsor, they work on diving deeper into the problem, understanding the problem, and then working on solving the problem. And then if the solution fits the problem, uh, there's promise then they figure out how to deploy and implement the solution within the appropriate government agency. Wow. Now I know that uh, while you guys really took the lead on kind of coordinating all the different stakeholders, there was a number of different parties that were involved in this. Who was involved in the development of, of this program? So we had uh, definitely, you can't pull something like this off alone. We've worked with, uh, let me see, I hope I don't forget anybody. But, um, <laughs> We've teamed up with, uh, first of all, uh, the, the folks at the Hacking for Homeland Security. Uh, there's two different uh, sister organizations, a common mission project, you know, folks like uh, Caitlin Bowers, uh, Alex Gallo, people like that, and uh, BMNT uh, as well. And uh, we've also teamed up with uh, the FEMA folks in Region 8 and um, uh, DHS, uh, Science and Technology, uh, who supported us with uh, quite a bit of uh, resources there. And just uh, uh, so there were folks from um, even CIS involved as well. So there, and then on, on the mine side, I've had all sorts of uh, folks supporting us uh, within our uh, uh, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Wow. So yeah, you definitely had quite a bit of folks involved in this project. Oh yeah. And I'm probably missing some folks. So I hope I mentioned everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So um, as, as part of this session, one of the things that you did was you went out and, and talked with some of the stakeholders that helped to develop this program. Tell us a little about who we're going to hear from uh, in this video. Yeah, based on the Inspire uh, audience, the, the folks I know are going to be participating in Inspire this year, um, I interviewed um, Lee DePaulo, who's the um, former administrator of Region 8, uh, FEMA Region 8. Uh, that region and Lee in particular are very well known for being the most innovative region of uh, FEMA. We've also uh, interviewed Connor uh, McClintock, who's the regional innovation uh, officer, uh, the Rhino as they call him, uh, who are, worked for with Lee in Region 8. But he has the um, uh, distinction of having worked across multiple government organizations at all sorts of different levels. So he's actually now on assignment uh, to deploy the course at uh, Carnegie Mellon with CISA. So he's working with a completely different agency, but at the federal level. And then um, Daniel Green, who uh, also worked for Region 8. And Daniel was uh, the public uh, affairs officer at the time, but he's now in charge of uh, a few more things that got added, got added on, onto his responsibility areas. And uh, he teamed up with some students. Uh, so he had that hands-on experience of working with the teams. And then uh, Kate uh, McCarthy uh, Bennett, she's uh, from Region 1 out of Boston, uh, who found out about what we were doing and uh, decided to submit her own problem um, 
for first responders. So she's also working currently. So Daniel's working, worked with a team in the past and works with the team currently. Kate works with the team currently. So I thought between all of them, you will get a nice sort of uh, well-rounded perspective of uh, how this all worked out. Absolutely. Now, uh, one of the things that you're interested in doing is, is taking this beyond the Colorado School of Mines and kind of making sure that other uh, academic institutions know about how to implement a program like this, how to partner with other Homeland Security and emergency management practitioners. Uh, so you're thinking about doing maybe some office hours to, uh, to coordinate with some of these folks uh, and show them how to, uh, to do this. What's the best way for them to, to participate in those office hours? Yeah, the easiest way for them uh, is to first get in touch with me, then I can give you a few uh, tips and just get to know you more and uh, learn from each other. I'd love to learn more about what you are dealing with and uh, tell you a little bit more about how it worked. And just sometimes these uh, office hours, as we call them, uh, you, you get a chance to ask more uh, specific and relevant questions than uh, a larger group. So I wanted to give people that chance. And uh, again, it's a two-way learning opportunity. I, I, I plan to learn and I hope to learn a lot more from them actually than they would from me, but it's an exchange. And so we can set those up and uh, we can talk one-on-one -on -one or with the team, your team, um, and um, help you out. And then if necessary, I'm happy to uh, depend on your need. I can put you in touch with uh, the right folks. I can put you in touch with uh, the Common Mission Project folks uh, who might help you with even more resources. Absolutely. Now, uh, the, the last thing I wanted to do before we turn folks over to these uh, interviews that you had held is um, you're also considering uh, some sort of a workshop where you can actually do it more of a formal um, educational process to get people from start to finish how to run a program like this. Right. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on when that might take place and how to, how to connect with you on, on getting involved in it? So we've been getting quite a few requests like this uh, over time. And the reason is we, uh, we work with someone who sponsors a, a, a problem. So a government agency, like a division of FEMA or, or somebody at the state level uh, or county level. And what we've learned is that you usually go through it with one set of expectations, but then after the first round, you know, run through, uh, then they come to us and say, oh, this you know, makes a lot more sense now. Can, now I can do a better job the second time around. And so we thought maybe we should put a workshop together where we just kind of go through the details of what's it like to work with students, what to expect, how to make it work, what, to, what you need to set up on your end to make this successful for you and how to really leverage it to uh, get ahead. So you're trying to solve problems. Um, this is not something that we want the, to, to have, you know, get in the way. We want this to be a... Uh, a tool that you use to get things done that you needed to get done. So it takes off your plate, hopefully. Um, and so what I'd like to do is if you, uh, if you wanna either set up office hours with me or um, uh, put a, you know, participate in a workshop, uh, fill out the form, the link in, in the resources uh, area uh, and this, fill out the form and just either tell me you want to spend some time with just uh, office hours type of time, or if you want to uh, be part of a workshop. And as soon as we get you know, enough people that say, hey, let's put a workshop together, we'll do it over Zoom. And uh, for now, and once COVID is done, maybe we'll uh, put a real one together and maybe I can work with, with you, Justin, and your folks to kind of uh, make that event happen in person if, uh, if we're allowed. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll be back in person uh, sooner than later. We'll see what happens with, uh, with yeah. COVID. But yeah, yeah. We, we, miss, um, we miss doing these in-person engagements with all the folks that normally are involved yeah. with NAPSIG and Inspire. So this sounds like a great, uh, great opportunity. Yeah. Sid, I, I can't thank you enough, not only for uh, being here today with us, but also coordinating and facilitating all these interviews that folks will get to watch. And hopefully they'll learn a little bit about uh, this very innovative program uh, that you've used to help dr drive innovation in public safety, emergency management, and homeland security. Thanks again, Sid. Oh, thank you. Hi, Lee. Hi, Sid. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. I just arrived out here in uh, sunny and somewhat hot Florida. Oh, hey. I think you're going to bring us some hot weather. 
because it's starting to warm up after a blizzard. <laughs> yeah, I got to enjoy that last bl blizzard that we had a little over a week ago when I was in Colorado. And man, that was some yeah. that shoveling some deep snow. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't have to worry about that anymore. That's right. I hope <laughs> not. That'd be bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so we're, uh, I wanted to chat with you today so we can share some of our uh, experience with uh, Innovate DMX and Innovate X uh, with the folks in Inspire who are going to be watching this later on. So maybe we start off by going back to when we all started. Remember the time when you reached out uh, to me back in December and we got together? Yeah, it was very fortunate that uh, that we did that. I remember myself and uh, Daniel Green uh, coming down and uh, meeting with you at the school, at Colorado School of Mines, and uh, Werner was there and it kind of kicked off with the ultimately ended up in the, the first pilot program for hacking for Homeland Security. It was right. kind of a, it was a, it was a tremendous journey that uh, they got us there. And then it, we did that all through, uh, through a pandemic. Yeah. No, that was fun. That was nice. So what uh, motivated you to think about innovation? Well, we, uh, we were always as a region and I'm the former region, FEMA region aid administrator uh, for the audience out there. Um, we were always thinking about new and better ways to do things. And uh, it, it got us on a, a path of, of innovation, unlike uh, uh, anyone else at the time in, uh, in FEMA. Uh, we even uh, dedicated a person uh, full time to innovation, we call him the Regional Innovation Officer or Rhino. And we kind of went about looking at different ways we could partner and put that partnership piece is so key, and particularly if you can partner and solve problems. And uh, one of our initial and, and certainly one of our most successful partnerships was with you and, uh, and the School of Mines. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, I remember that time when we started talking about what we could possibly do. I don't think we had envisioned um, actually tackling the number of problems, the variety of problems we, we worked on uh, in the class, in the course. So maybe we can talk about how we got from uh, your vision of engaging sort of students and outside partners in uh, innovating with your FEMA team, uh, all the way to how do we put together a set of problems that someone can tackle? So the initial vision was we were gonna start, um, uh, we kind of branded the EMX, the Emergency Management uh, um, Excellence. Yep. Yep. And, and that was going to be, uh, you know, the, the FEMA brand, not just the FEMA brand, the emergency management brand for, for problem solving and partnerships with academia. So the vision was to uh, start in Colorado um, and we were going to bring together Colorado EMX in uh, April of, of 2020. Uh, it was going to be facilitated by the Center of Homeland Defense and Security. Uh, you were going to host it. Uh, uh, I think right there with it, where you're uh, got the picture in your background. Right. And uh, we were going to provide, you know, our emergency management expertise along with the state partners and other universities across the front range primarily. Uh, and that was a vision. We were excited about it. It was going to kind of set the stage for where we could go in the future. Um, and then this thing called COVID happened. And uh, we certainly, uh, we as FEMA were the lead federal agency at that time. And our focus turned to, uh, uh, to the, the response for the pandemic. Uh, so we had to put that on ice and ultimately uh, we moved into other areas and that would lead us to uh, the hacking for Homeland Security. Yeah, I guess uh, in, a, in, in hindsight, looking back, maybe that was a good way for us to test uh, our own collaborative uh, resilience, right? COVID happened and we had to figure out how to adapt uh, to solve that problem. Yeah, that, that's for sure. And, and you know, part of what uh, uh, what we did also during, during COVID was we brought innovation into uh, our response. Um, mm -hmm. We stood up a private-public partnership fusion cell that was led by our regional innovation officer, and that that uh, fused together uh, the innovation side of, of things with the, the uh, private sector partnerships with logistics and some finance. So to try to find unique ways to overcome the big problem that we had at that time, which was uh, very high demand and no supply. Uh, so that that was that partnership was unique in 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 that regard, particularly with the innovation piece. Uh, and then the second thing we did and and uh, was work with you all and, and did things like uh, the hackathon, 
mm -hmm. uh, to, to focus on uh, specifically COVID problems. And that was new to us. Uh, we hadn't done something like that in, in their, their shorter duration, uh, but it was very interesting and, and it really brought to light the power of, uh, of students and their ability to, to facilitate and help us solve problems. Yeah, that was fun to do. Um, so for our audience, what we did is we had this um, two hour uh, flash uh, hackathon, flash challenge, where we had students work with FEMA folks on formulating and writing up problems that we could tackle together. And then uh, about a month later, we had a hackathon, a 24 hour hackathon, where we took a further deeper dive into those problems and try to uh, frame them in a way that students can work on um, for later. And so the, I think the fun part for me was the, the idea that we could sit down and think about symptoms of problems, not just problems, because as, as you probably know, uh, at least from our experience, um, we end up tackling, sometimes we frame problems in a way where we're focused on the symptoms. And then when you do a deeper dive later, we find out that those problems are, the symptoms are really symptoms, not the core cause of the problem. Yeah, we, we definitely uh, do that. And uh, we're guilty of that, certainly in FEMA, jumping right to what we think is a solution based on a problem that we're, we're sort of defining um, maybe uh, too broadly, or uh, maybe we're, we're not really defining the problem. And that's one of the things, uh, Sid, I think that, uh, I don't think, I know, uh, pardon me for that, that, uh, that you all have really helped us out with and, and worked on our problem solving skills. And uh, that's why it's so fun to participate in the process uh, where you go from the beginning and, and the students start to learn all the way to the end when they're given their, their out briefs, um, uh, like their pitches at the end and, and watch what they did and how they worked through the problem solving methodology. So that's right. been a, a big benefit for, for us on the, the federal government side and uh, certainly will make us better. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was great for us too, because we've, the students and us, we all learned a lot about the amazing uh, motivation, energy, capabilities, and everything you bring to the table. And so I think it was a wonderful way of uh, teaming up to look at things from various perspectives, not just, you know, we, we always start with your perspective because you're the experts, uh, and then add to that, you know, you know, we're curious about this perspective or that perspective, and that way you can look at problems and look at potential solutions from a variety of angles, not just from one or two or three. And so I think that's probably one of the exciting things that I found out of this whole experience. And then um, maybe we can share with folks too um, how we prepared uh, FEMA folks, your folks, your team uh, to work with us. And, and I can talk about how we prepared folks on our side uh, to kind of bring this collaboration together. So I'll start with, because you can get into better details on the specifics of, of the collaboration. But what we did on the Region 8 side was we committed and we're all in. And we really had a good number of mentors and a good number of problems to submit to you. I believe it was it was 20 to 25 <laughs> problems. You're not gonna, you don't pick all those. You ended up with seven, but, uh, uh, and, and so we, we brought that to, uh, to the table. We also brought partnerships that went beyond FEMA uh, the state of Colorado, the Department of Emergency Management, uh, mm -hmm. submitted a problem, and it was one of the ones that was picked up. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, Region 8, submitted a problem. It was also one of the ones uh, that was picked up, which was really cool. So it was not, not just, uh, just the FEMA Region 8 uh, submissions there. And those are, those are partners that we work with all the time. So we brought that team uh, over to uh, and committed to you uh, once the that we defined once you, the students selected and formed their teams, that we were gonna be part of it the whole way through. And, and we certainly were uh, yeah. in, in that regard. Yeah, I really look back and I see one of the huge strengths of our collaboration was the fact that you all committed time to this. I mean, the fact that we could take the time to learn about each other, get to know each other early on, and then help the students, the, the time commitment, and, and it was enjoyable. I mean working with you guys and talking to you on a regular basis, uh, we've learned a lot and we just found it to be fun, just a great working relationship. And I had the same feedback from the, the FEMA side. They enjoyed getting on there and being mentors and, 
and uh, and working with the students. Um, I think that was, and ultimately, especially when they get to, I'll call it game day, right? For the the demo day is a formal name. I'll use the, the right name uh, for the audience here. And um, it's, it's just fun for, the, for the, our folks that work day in and day out with the yeah. students to see the ultimate feedback and everything that came from the demos. And they were all fantastic. Yeah, no, and, and one of the things that I was concerned about in the beginning um, was the commitment of time. Like, because, you know, we, we started collaborating, uh, at, as you said, and COVID just hit right away. So um, it's not like this was a relaxed time. You had huge responsibilities to deal with. And at the same time, so I was worried that you guys will want, you know, you'll have priorities to deal with that rightly so need to be paid attention to. Uh, but also I was worried that, you know, our students don't have emergency management expertise. They've never, uh, I mean, so for some of them, this was the first time they even get exposed to FEMA uh, mm -hmm. or, or any branch of government for that matter. And so I was worried that uh, their sort of novice or novel kind of views might be uh, viewed as, you know, what do these guys know? You know, how could they possibly be helping us or collaborating with us? Um, so maybe you can comment on, on how that looked on your end. Yeah, I think uh, we had to, we had some learning on our, of, of our own to do, right? That this was a, it's a class and we, we're not going to go in there on day one and expect it to be whiteboarding out solutions to uh, the big problems that we pr presented in there and understood that that it's a learning process for, for everyone. And while we're going through that with the students and, you, and providing the emergency management expertise, we're also learning at the same time uh, and getting better. And, and I think that was part of the, the, the joy of, of, of for, for the Region 8 team and being, being part of this. And, and the students at Colorado School of Mines are, are amazing, amazing kids. And they're not all kids, I shouldn't use that term. Amazing people. Yeah. And, um, they, uh, they have a significant workload and they're committing time to learn entrepreneurial skills and, and, uh, and problem solving skills and they seem to enjoy it. And so you feed off that energy when they're enjoying what they're doing. And it's not just, oh, I got a, I have another class and mm -hmm. they get excited about it. And that, that, that right. gives us energy as, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, federal civil servants. Right. So Lee, would you uh, share with our audience uh, your vision for um, InnovateX and what the future might hold for InnovateX and you? Absolutely. I think uh, a couple different things. When I, when I, I'll start with a big picture from the DHS perspective because I think what we really want to see happen is continued expansion uh, across all the components of DHS for the hacking for homeland security piece. And, uh, and, and what that can mean. And maybe uh, courses designed around all the components, vice just emergency management or uh, uh, subsets. Uh, for Innovate X with Minds, uh, I, I, I really like uh, where you went this semester with a, a broader portfolio of problem solving. It's not, not just set uh, to emergency management. Hopefully I can stay involved. Uh, you know, I'm now in Florida in, in the schools in Colorado with the beauty of technology and all we've learned uh, through the, the COVID crisis was we can do this remotely and still uh, stay really engaged. So uh, if, if you have me, I, I hope to uh, to stay involved with uh, with your program there because I, I, I think so highly of it. Absolutely. We'd love to uh, have you get involved as an instructor, advisor, in any whichever way you'd like. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. And uh, maybe we share uh, what we've tried with uh, other schools, other in, you know emergency management uh, folks at different levels. I'd love to see more state level people involved, more local people involved. So we'll figure this out together. Yeah, that sounds really good. And I look forward to uh, staying engaged because it's such a great way to, uh, to partner uh, and, uh, and move, uh, move forward with, with uh, the relationships that, that we have um, across multiple universities, as you said, and yeah. uh, solve problems. Yeah, let's do it. All Thanks right. Great time, Lee. Appreciate it very well, th much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I, I appreciate uh, appreciate the interview. Anytime. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Hey, Connor. How are you? Hey, Sid. Good to see you. Good to see you too. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been. It's been Good. a fun detail. Hey, so I want to introduce you to our audience today. So why don't you maybe? Uh, 
give uh, a quick overview on what you've done, your role in Region 8, and uh, what you're doing today. All right. Uh, well, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor McClintock. I, uh, um, but, uh, traditionally, I'm the Regional Innovation Officer for, for uh, FEMA Region 8 uh, in Denver, Colorado. Um, currently, uh, for the, 20, the year 2021, I'm uh, on loan to the CIS, to CISA, which is the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, helping them build uh, um, their their agency innovation program. But um, normally, I'm back in Region 8 doing fun, innovative projects and and uh, working on building the culture of innovation for Region 8 and FEMA, and working with awesome people like Sid. Great. Well, hey, so tell the audience about you know, how does, you know, the different partners benefit from this, starting with DHS, FEMA, and a local uh, emergency manager? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I mean, so there's a number of benefits, there's a lot of benefits. Uh, the first would be, you know, the, the obvious one, which is like tackling persistent problems um, with, a, with, you know, new diversity of thought, um, kind of new young blood, or just new blood in general. Um, people who are not, as they say, especially we like to say in emergency management, you hear it all the time. It's like, they're not super close to the flagpole. They're not too close. So they can, they can look at it without the, the traditional bias that we, we look at problems with based on our own experiences in emergency management and the, in the old way of doing, doing things. Yeah. So people can, uh, so that's the obvious one is, is really like a new creative way to tackle some of our persistent problems that we deal with in, in disaster response and emergency management. Um, the other one is, you know, I mentioned the, the new blood and young blood, um, you know, is just getting exposure to, to the field, to um, people who traditionally would not be exposed to it, not only in just like the sense of like uh, public service, mm -hmm. but also selfishly in, in emergency management and disaster response. Um, you know, working with Sid in Colorado School of Mines, we, we led the very first pilot for Hacking for Homeland Security and, and worked with InnovateX and Mines on this. And, you know, these are students who, you know, write, you know, oil and gas and make a lot of money out in the private sector who never would have even known about or considered, you know, public service or working with FEMA and emergency management. And then one semester exposed them from the state of Montana, the state of Colorado emergency management to FEMA to CISA region eight. And they got a whole wide swath of uh, exposure and it, and it really uh, piqued a lot of young uh, um, students interest in, in public service and, and working in a field that they never really would have considered. So th those are two of the main drivers, I would say. Yeah, to your point, we've had a few people come to us at the end of this last semester asking how they can, uh, can you know, explore career opportunities in emergency management, and that never happened before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, I, like me personally, I'm a people person. That's that's my number one benefit because I think if you go in thinking that these people, this this program is going to just absolutely solve your problem, then you're going to um, like. The, you shouldn't expect that. You, what you should expect is them to look at your problem differently and give you a new perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if they solve it, yay, that's like, that's the icing on the cake. Yeah. But the real, the real benefit to me is, is, um, is that, that mm -hmm. diversity of thought and exposing a whole new generation and, and a whole new group of people who don't, you know, these aren't emergency managers. They're not studying disaster response management. They're studying engineering and policy and different things that, you know, really wouldn't, drive them toward this field and it, and it could really uh, help advance the field of emergency management. That's great, yeah. So how would, what would, you, how would you advise someone who wants to get in this uh, way of thinking? Like, you know, they wanna reach out to their local university or to us and say, okay, what do I even, I'm, an, I'm a local emergency manager in a county or a state level, um, where do I even start? How do I get started? Experimentation and connections. The world, I, I think everyone in emergency management should know uh, one of the basic tenets is, is you shouldn't be meeting your, your partners and stakeholders at a disaster. It's all about building those relationships ahead of time. So think of the same thing in this, is go to, go to your local community college, go to your, find out what, what programs are, community college, universities, anything uh, in your state, region, local area, um, and, and think outside of the box, go talk to them and say, hey, um, you know, I, I would love, so 
using the word experiment or pilot kind of frees people from like, you know, a lot of tensions that might be involved in this. So you say, hey, I just want to test something out. They're like, yeah, let's let's try it out mm-hmm. um, and, and propose an idea or just say, hey, like I would love to um, let's just let's just get together and think together about stuff, you know, and, and that's yeah. what will really get people excited. It exposes them. And then that's where you'll find um, the opportunity to be able to, to partner and do this stuff. And then, and then, um, you know, I think that's the number one thing. If I was local emergency manager, like find out, you know, local nonprofit, just find, find people who are willing to, to talk to you, talk to your, you know, local department, you know, uh, chamber of commerce and, you know, different things, different stakeholders and say, Hey, can we all get together and talk about this? Cause this is going to affect you guys. Like what the problem I'm dealing with is going to affect all of us. So how do we all get together right now to talk about it and bring in, you know, the, the, the local, uh, higher education or academic, I mean, even high school. Yeah. 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 Like, I think that's, that's the way to kind of look at this and just start those conversations and you'll see who the people who want to partner and start doing creative stuff with. And uh, to wrap up, maybe can I put you on the spot and say something yeah. like uh, where uh, maybe you and I offer to facilitate some of these initial conversations if people want to? Uh, I would have. I mean, Sid, Sid knows me well. He said, I'm going to put you on the spot, but he threw me a softball because uh, he knows <laughs> that like I get energy from this stuff and I love it. And, and yeah. I think um, my number one thing is, is kind of brokering these, these partnerships and brokering these relationships and seeing these kind yeah. of tangential um, opportunities to, to help people uh, attack problems differently. So I would love to, to yeah. join in and help anybody kind of facilitate that or brainstorm how they can do it better. Well, there you go, folks. So if you need help getting started, just uh, reach out to us and we'll uh, at least help you um, share with you what we've tried and what worked, what didn't, and help you start conversations. Great. Well, thanks awesome. for joining. Thank you for joining me today and dropping in. And uh, have a great day. We'll continue this conversation, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thanks, Sid. Thanks for having me. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, Connor. Bye. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Sid. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Oh, it's another uh, snowy afternoon in Colorado. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to drop in and chat with me and share your experience with uh, our Inspire audience. Yeah, of course. Anything for you, Sid. Oh, thanks. Hey, can you share with our audience your experience as someone who was deeply involved in sponsoring a problem in uh, last semester and this semester's InnovateX uh, course? Yeah, sure. So I, I've had the luck uh, now to be involved with not just setting up the course and not just working with one team, but uh, setting up two courses and working with two teams. Uh, and it's been uh, an absolutely uh, fantastic experience, like getting under the hood and messing around and seeing how to set this thing up and make it run. And then also sitting back and watching it take off. Um, you know, and setting up the course, it was really great because we got to have an internal discussion. What are the big problems we really need to solve in emergency management? Uh, and we made sure when we set this up in Region 8 that it wasn't just... Um, FEMA, you know, and I know like in emergency management, uh, what is the most pressing man, uh, issue for a local government versus the state government versus the federal government, they don't often align. So uh, one of the things we did with this right from the beginning was we made sure to bring in some state partners and we tried to do everything we could to bring in the local perspective as well. Mm-hmm. So from the very beginning, we, we made sure this is not going to be a FEMA project, it's going to be an emergency management project. Um, and that also was a really helpful uh, decision because the teams, uh, I mean, like Sid, you've got great students. You've got fantastic engineering and business and innovation students, but they're not emergency managers. Right. So they had to learn this on the fly. Uh, and we actually found that by making sure we had all these different levels of emergency management involved, uh, the local, the state, the federal, uh, nonprofits, uh, and so on and so forth, Uh, these students got caught up to speed really quick. They asked a lot of questions. They wanted to know what was happening. And so by the end of it, they were talking to us in our own language, which was really fantastic to see. Mm -hmm. Um, So both in terms of how we built the class and how we worked with the teams, we tried to do everything we could to make sure that everyone was at the table. We wanted as big of a table as possible for as many different viewpoints and perspectives to come in. And it was great. It was really great. 
Uh, my team worked on a really uh, particular issue for the American West, wildfires. And we particularly were looking at uh, evacuation, which, you know, the beautiful thing about this class is, I, and it's a bit of advice I'd offer anybody who wants to do this, keep an open mind, because what you think the problem is may not actually be the problem. Like, let the students investigate and run and inquire. Yeah. So, you know, I had that experience with my team. My team wanted to immediately focus on, well, how do we shelter people? And then very quickly, they found out, eh, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about making sure that people evacuating know how to evacuate where they're supposed to go, which is a intrinsically local issue, even as wildfires increasingly become federal issues, just because of the resources it takes to handle them. So my team went with a direction I did not foresee. I'm happy they did it. They found a solution that I wasn't even looking for, but was desperately needed, especially as I talked to the city, county, and uh, state emergency managers and wildland firefighters. And uh, yeah, it was great. It was an issue that um, brought in all kinds of different perspectives, taught the students real quickly how they should get into emergency management and how they should uh, understand the field as a practice. It came up with a solution that I wasn't anticipating, but at the end of the day, I uh, ended up being exactly what was needed for the people who face this sort of stuff down all the time. And I'll say uh, that team was considered uh, to have the uh, second best solution that semester. I'm still not salty uh, <laughs> because uh, it's my boss who had the first best team. <laughs> no, that's awesome. No, thanks for sharing that perspective on the student side. What about the, I know you also helped coordinate and uh, support some of your colleagues, uh, the FEMA sponsors of other problems. How did they evolve through their interaction with the students? Yeah, so they came in, um, you know, FEMA and emergency management is very dogmatic. You know, we, we, we have our solution in mind and we just are figuring out how to apply it to the problem. What's the way that we get there? Here's point A, here's point B. We know both, it's the in-between, we don't know. So this was really eye-opening for a lot of them to realize we have point A and who knows where it's gonna go, right? They, they just didn't know. And it was really fun. Some, some, some people had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Uh, it helped them learn. It helped them see things from a new perspective. Uh, they enjoyed working with the student teams. Uh, I, I don't think a single person had an issue working with the team at all. Um, sure. So it, it was fun because it was kind of um, mm -hmm. it was kind of like from the mouth of babes type phenomenon, <laughs> but with uh, Silicon Valley style stick to itiveness and emergency management grit. Right. So what advice would you give uh, um, an emergency manager at, uh, at any local level uh, if they wanted to team up with their local university and do something like this? Uh, first of all, I would say take the time up front to set your class up, curate the problems, make sure that you have uh, something that it's not too small, that the students will find the solution in just a week or two, but also make sure it's, uh, it's not a problem that's so big and daunting that no one can find a solution, right? Um, it's one thing to say we need a solution for housing that can survive floods. That's cool. That's engineering. That's design. It's a whole other thing to say we need to fix the National Flood Insurance Program. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we do need to fix it. But good God, you're asking like a team of three to solve, you know, massive policy legislation, uh, actuarial problems. I'm right there with you. I want to fix it, but let's just, let's keep it here. Let's keep it realistic and attainable. You know, right. um, that's the first thing I would say. And then I would also say, uh, make sure that when you do this, go into it completely willing to just see where this goes. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's like people, it's like people in a rodeo, you know, when you're on a Bronco, <laughs> you are not trying to steer where the Bronco goes. You are just trying to hold on and see where you end right. up. Right. Uh, just go with it. Right. No, that's great advice. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, thinking about problems and ways to kind of improve your process, um, any um, sort of, sur not surprises, but things that uh, were sort of pleasant, uh, you know, they sort of, uh, it, let me make it real for people who might be listening to us. I'm an emergency manager. I'm, I already have a full plate of things to do. I mean, it's, I'm not looking for more work. 
but you're telling me that the students who know nothing are going to join and actually help. Isn't that, that sounds like a, like a lot of extra time and extra work. Uh, how do you reconcile, you know, I got all this stuff to do and now I got, I, I got help, but it's help that I need to help. Yeah, so we found uh, in Region 8, what is it that we found? Uh, I think it was, on average, two and a half hours a week with these teams, uh, which included your class time that you set up, which was an hour long. So, all right, there's an hour that is out of your hands. You just show up. Um, and then, you know, everyone else kind of set up some other little thing on the side. I think with my team on average, I worked about three hours a week, but as we went along and they got more skilled and they investigated more and they learned more about what the problem was, you know, the time just, it went down, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were at three hours a week and then we were at two and a half. And then by the end of it, uh, we were talking for 30 minutes before the class, like a day before the class. And then in the class, we were wrapping up early. Um, so, so let me just, for anyone who is worried about the time constraint, a couple of things there, uh, it may be a little, you know, sort of, uh, can I do this up front, but I promise you make the time for it and you will work yourself out of a job. Um, the other thing to stress with it is, um, you know, uh, though the more time you spend up front, the better the solution you're going to get, right? Uh, you'll be able to guide them. You'll be able to steer them and say, you know, maybe you should talk to this person or have you guys looked up this or have you studied this? And, you know, remember, the other thing is these, these are students. Mm -hmm. This isn't contractors. This isn't a office workforce. These are people who are for, you know, lack of a better term, they're professional learners. They are out there to investigate and learn. They want to do this stuff. Give them stuff to talk to. Give them stuff to read. Give them people to talk to. And for the most part, I mean, there's always an exception here or there they will just eat it up with just an undying amount of passion. They want to learn. They want to get into a new field and learn new things. Yeah. Spend the time up front. It becomes easier later. And, and you get the added benefit of actually having tried multiple solutions. So, you know, it's kind of like a lab. You use the students to try things that you don't have the time or the resources to try yourself. But at the end, you're going to find out what worked, what doesn't work. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I mean, uh, the beauty of higher education in the United States is, you know, it's like a post enlightenment toward, sort of approach to things still. Here we are hundreds of years later, and we are still throw out things for the sake of investigation and critical thinking and analysis. And yeah, my team came up with several iterations of stuff. Well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? You know, and every now and then I would kind of have to go, that's a good idea. You should know there's already a bunch of competing, uh, competing products out there, uh, which I was never trying to tell them no. I was just trying to steer them towards what's the solution that nobody's thought of. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, it was really fun. A lot of mental exercises, a lot of thought exercises. And I would say that that's also one of the most important things people need to realize going into this. It's like banish no from your vocabulary. <laughs> like don't be about telling them what they can't do be about empowering them to see what they can do right yeah so you can find out what works or doesn't so at the end you end up with the benefit because they try it with you and on your behalf yes absolutely and i mean like if you want to be really cynical and i'm sure sid you love me talking about your students this way they're guinea pigs they're free labor go at it man i mean like <laughs> just seize this moment how many times do we get you know, people who will basically work as contractors for free. Yeah, for the learning experience. Means yeah, absolutely. For the love of learning and for the chance to just propose an idea and see it succeed. Right. Yeah, to do good, to help, to make a difference. Great. Anything else you want to add about your experience that uh, I haven't thought of asking you? And there's just one thing I can say about why you want to do a course like this and why emergency managers should adapt it. Uh, it. It is that this is about finding solutions today from the leaders of tomorrow. These, these, this, these upcoming students, they are going to be in leadership positions. Um, they are going to be the engineers of tomorrow. They're going to be the C-suite leaders. They're going to be in politics. They're going to be the technocrats. They're going to be, you know, what have you. Um, give them a head start 
to start finding the solutions that affect our communities today. So when they are the leaders tomorrow, we have a stronger, more resilient, more prepared nation. Awesome. I couldn't put it any better. Well, thanks for stopping by, Daniel, and good luck with all the things you have to deal with uh, this week and next week. Perfect. Hey, thanks a lot. And uh, you know what? I'll see you in the next class for Innovate X, which is the uh, fantastic successor to the Hacking for Homeland Security program we launched. We're still yes. going strong in Colorado. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Great. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. You. Bye, Sid. Bye, Daniel. Hi, Kate. Hey, Sid. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Nice thanks to for, chat. Yeah, thanks for dropping in. So I wanted to uh, chat with you a little bit and give our Inspire audience uh, your perspective on working and getting involved with uh, InnovateX. So maybe you can first start us off by telling the audience a little bit about what you do in Region 1. Sure, thank you. So. Um, so my role in Region 1, I work for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, in Region 1 out of Boston. And as Region, oh, sorry, Sid. I, I'm sorry. I messed up. Hi, Kate. Hey, hi. How are you today? Good. And you? I'm doing great, thank you. Hello from Rhode Island. Oh, great. So thanks for dropping in and uh, sharing uh, with my Inspire audience your uh, experience with InnovateX. So maybe we can start off by uh, you telling us what you uh, all, what you do in uh, Region 1. Great. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today. So excited to talk with everybody and share a little bit about my experiences. So in Region 1, I actually work as the Disability Integration Advisor. And basically what that means is there's one of us per region, so only 10 of us across the country working in this area. And our focus is not only working with FEMA, but working with our federal partners and our states on a focus of inclusion. So everything is inclusive throughout the whole emergency management system for the whole community. Great, because I'm sure emergency management, uh, first responders, all folks like that deal with uh, f people with disabilities. We it's kind of a, a good good area to cover to make sure we cover. Yeah, and when we're thinking about at-risk populations, we're thinking about people with disabilities, we're thinking about seniors, we're thinking about those who have chronic health conditions and individuals who don't speak English as a first language. And what's kind of unique about my position is I've been able to kind of specialize in some additional research areas. So my specialty is focusing on kind of sea burn incidents or hazardous material incidents and the impacts of those uh, for at-risk populations. It's, a, it's an exciting area for research. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about your involvement with uh, InnovateX. How did you hear about it? Yeah, so I, I, I'll tell you, InnovateX, it's been a fabulous experience here as a sponsor. So I've been working uh, quite a bit with our region, Region 1, on the, the concept of innovation and how do we increase innovation and how do we work with students that might not necessarily have a strong background in emergency management, but give them an opportunity to understand the process from, you know, when a disaster happens, uh, right on through, through preparedness, response, recovery, mitigation, and kind of learn a little bit more about it and have that, have that collaboration. And so in working uh, with the region, I had the opportunity to learn a bit more about it. And uh, based on some research that I did, I was able to put together a proposal and submit it. Great. So what uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the problems that you was submitted and how did that go from your submission to what the students uh, worked on? Yeah, absolutely. So I have first I have a great team of students. I mean, they couldn't be I mean, it's just so much fun between having office hours with the students and also working with them once a week during class and in between it's just been such a wonderful but yeah, so the problem uh, that I focused on goes back to my work that I do in the um, in the Seaburn world, uh, especially with chemical incidents and mass casualty chemical incidents. And what was found is that uh, FEMA had the opportunity to participate in some research that showed that during a mass casualty chemical incident, the individuals go through a decontamination process. So they go through three phases, kind of like a dry decontamination to a ladder pipe with the fire hoses onto a technical. And there's very specific procedures that individuals go through. And what was interesting was that in the study that we did, we found that individuals who fall in that at-risk category, it actually takes them up to eight to 10 times longer to get through the process. And so that has resulted in 
you know, a huge gap in terms of research. This was the first time we had any evidence-based research that said, wait a minute, we have a whole population of people that are not making it through the process. And so in, in kind of looking at sort of the larger study, um, I was able to work with, um, work with you, as you know, and I put in a, a few ideas of different avenues that could go down because there were a lot of gaps. And we had the opportunity to go through and really kind of focus in on one area in particular looked at uh, communications and how first responders were communicating with the population. How did they communicate with uh, patients or casualties who were deaf or hard of hearing? How did they communicate with someone who might be blind or visually impaired? Or, or how did they communicate with someone who didn't speak English as a first language? And that particular component out of six different areas that I submitted was the one that the students were really interested in working on. And so that's what we've been working on. Great. And how did it go? How did you know what do you plan to do with uh, what came out of your interaction with the students? Yeah, so what came out of the interaction with the students? I'll tell you, it's been, as I said, it's been a, a fascinating experience and a wonderful opportunity to really tap into innovation and tap into creativity and having the students working together, whether they're working individually or coming together as a team. I think one of the interesting things that we see is everybody, as you know, has different learning styles, different strategies, you know, their strengths. And this particular team uh, immediately identified where the different strengths were. So some students were stronger and technical, others like the research and pulling it all together, they've been able to come up with some fascinating areas to focus on. And what they did is we started right from the beginning and kind of looked at what the problem was, gave them the opportunity to step back, think about it, uh, come up with some creative solutions. I love to use the concept of wish, wild wish fantasy. I don't know, have you heard about that one before? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, basically, you know, you have your you have your wish, you have your wild wish, but I'm always like, well, let's think totally outside the box. How far can you possibly go? Because the further you can go with the creativity and stimulate the conversation and the discussion, the problem solving, the more likely you're gonna come up with an innovative solution. And yeah. so each week, you know, we kind of work through that process as they kind of uh, framed in on the focus of communications. That's perfect. And it's, um, have you run into situations where the, the students surprised you in some way? Well, it's interesting, you know, how the students went about it is once they sort of did their research review, uh, they then tapped in and I worked with them on identifying some individuals to interview to really understand the problem. Because as I said, they may not have had a background in emergency management. And, you know, I, we were tossing right into a problem on chemical incidents. And if they were not familiar with that, it was important to first have an understanding of, well, you know, what does that mean? And, and who are these first responders? And what equipment do they wear? And so they had an opportunity to talk with uh, first responders from across the country, and also with responders um, who worked on some of the research. And, and they were able to tap into them and kind of talk through now, you know, what are your personal experiences in working with this population? What have you found? To just to start to begin to validate some of the things that they've come up with. And that was what I saw. They were, they were so excited because they came up with the issues and the problems. They did their interviews and all of a sudden you saw that spark in their eye that yes, I'm on to something. And then they were starting to move forward into the next step where they're at now. Yeah. No, I've at least from my perspective, my sense was that they were all, all engaged all the way in. And I had to make sure that, you know, are they really contributing? Are they really making sure they're following procedure in terms of identifying the problem, uh, interviewing people for evidence that they're learning the right way? So all of that stuff was great. Yeah, and what's interesting is not only did they do that, but as they came up with their problem and, and then worked on their creative solution, you know, based on the interviews and going back and looking at things, as they began to develop, uh, you know, their their solution, their prototype in terms of what they're going to do, what they did, and I, I was so impressed with this, is they said, you know what, we want to go back. And before we go any further, we want to go back and talk to a few of the key ones that we really felt like we connected with and just kind of bounce off where we were at. And I had the opportunity to sit in on a few of those. I mean, some of these are colleagues that I've worked with. And I'll tell you, I was so, I was so impressed and I've been impressed with the students to begin with, but in listening to them talk and share what they're what they're thinking, and then taking the feedback uh, from the first responders and from those who respond to chemical incidents, and then actually taking that and merging it in and seeing them kind of take their problem and take their solution and even tweak it at that point. And um, and now they're really onto um, 
onto some exciting, uh, exciting solutions right now. Good. So what's next for you and the team? So with the team right now, as I said, they're working on, on their, um, their prototype and that's being done. And they're also working on a white paper. The students are very interested in um, having it published. So I'm working with them on actually writing a paper to put forth and have it published. And that's always interesting because my, my question to them is, well, what do you want first for your next steps? Because in my role as a sponsor, I'm here I'm here to support them. I'm here to, you know, guide them, provide feedback and, you know, just work with them to the next step. And when they said they were really interested in not only developing something, but then taking it and writing it, I was like, this is wonderful. So we're working on that. And then because, like I said in the beginning, this particular problem is, is so large in terms of the at-risk population that what the students have decided to do is they're actually going to take where they're at and with the actual development of what they're doing and the drafting of the paper and the submission of the article, and then they're going to transition it over to another group to kind of pick it up from there to take it to the very next step. And I'll just watching that process and having them be able to document and explain it and see it being carried over to the next group. I mean, we're taking a, a large problem. And when you think about it, yeah. you know, goal here is to really uh, collaborate and, and work on some of our most challenging um, issues, in, you know, before, during, and after a disaster. And so to actually see it go from one group where they're at and to think it's going to continue, I mean, we're, we're just absolutely thrilled with that. Yeah. No, that's great to hear. And in terms of your time uh, involvement, uh, was how do you feel about how much time you put into it? Was it too much? Was it the right amount? Was it a burden? Was it okay? Because yeah. I'm sure a lot of people would be thinking about that too. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I think, you know, I have, um, I have the great support of, uh, of my area and my region, and they 100% they support the work and in terms of our collaboration. And so in terms of the workload, I, I think once things were set and had a schedule, establishing office hours right off the bat, an opportunity to chat with the students, and I did that every Monday, and then we met with class on Wednesday, and then things would be in the Google Drive, so we'd have an opportunity to go in there. And but I think that overall, no, I think the time frame that and the work uh, actually was just it, it worked out fine in terms of the workload. Yeah, so it felt uh, like a natural integration within your daily, everyday work. Yeah. It, it was. And I mean, uh, for me in the beginning, of course, I mean, my, my personality and everybody's different is I wanted to read everything up on everything, you know, learn about the students. They post their resumes, you learn about them. And I, I really wanted to engage and, and get to know them in the beginning. So I spent a little bit more time, you know, getting to know them in the beginning and, you know, just chatting and, you know, building up that rapport. Because if we're going to work together for the whole semester, we didn't just want it to always be so efficient. Right. So, you know, finding out, you know, what, what they enjoy doing on the weekends when they're not working and all of that. And um, yeah, and then just focusing in once the schedule was in place, I think that's the critical piece. Once the schedule is in place and you kind of know things are due on a certain day, then I'd be able to tap in there. And of course, I'm, you know, being in emergency management, uh, you know, our phone's going seven days a week. So I have sort of a policy of anytime you have a question, anything you need, you just, just send me a quick note and, um, you know, and we'll, and we'll coordinate. Great. So it's been easy to kind of make it work. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think if anybody is interested in, you know, just, just working with students and, you know, seeing, seeing them be inspired and creative and, and going and kind of, you know, diving into a problem and watching that process and, and yeah. seeing, you know, how creative they are. I mean, it's just been, um, it, yeah, it's been an amazing experience um, for me as, as a speaker. Yeah, and I know working with them in class on the other side, they really are thrilled to be able to bring uh, uh, an actual solution to the problem you, you, you presented and submitted in a way where they could be proud of like uh, the, the thing that strikes me the most about their work is that they're looking at this as we can make a difference in someone's life and um, hand it off and move on but be proud of what we've done yeah you know you're absolutely right and i think one of the things that we talked about right in the beginning is you know the problem itself yeah but also the population i mean everybody has someone in their life who has a disability or chronic health condition oh, yeah elderly someone you know and so they really do know that they're making a difference and i and i think that that's key and they know that when when they come out of this 
the, the item that they're developing and the research that they're writing about. I mean, everybody is so excited on this end with the first responders that they talk to. And, and you can see it. You can see their excitement that they actually have something that's going to make a significant difference, yeah. especially right now when we don't, we don't have anything. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, they, they get sold on this so easily because when they see that they're actually able to go from very little to a solution that makes a difference that you are happy with, that makes a difference in the target population's lives, it's it's like they're now engaged with with government in a at all levels in a very different way than ever before absolutely and and you see that in the conversations and understanding not just about the problem but the big picture you know what is emergency management and and where does that fall in and and mm -hmm. what are these incidents that are hazardous material incidents and and like you said you, you know one of the students is very technical focused and you know has such a background and technology and and just listening and, and watching how they're developing things. And another student is very strong in writing and, and going and starting to write and do the research. It's just been a, um, a fascinating way to watch them kind of merge their learning styles and come up with something that's going to be a solution that that really is. It's going to make a difference. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I'm looking forward to uh, working with you on the next phase going through uh, summer and beyond. So yeah, hopefully I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, we won't, we, won't, we won't be working on one problem. We'll be working on maybe multiple problems with multiple themes, I really hope. Oh, that would be that would be wonderful. I mean, it's been on behalf of like FEMA and it's just been a, a wonderful experience for me uh, to have the opportunity to engage and, and to really, you know, get some solutions to a really challenging problem that we have not been able to solve. We don't have the, the ability to solve it. So to be able to come out of this with something and then move it to the next one is just... Um, yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Thanks for having a chat with me and sharing your experience with our Inspire audience. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later, Kate. Okay, bye now. Bye.